This initiative, uh, Harvard often seems to be in the lead on things, I, I don't think could be more timely uh, for several reasons. One, I think indeed there now exists a foundation to upgrade instruction, upgrade our own learning, and often in very unintuitive ways and ways that are at odds with uh, standard practices. Also, the whole world is changing in ways that are hard to predict in terms of how much learning will be online, on your own, blended courses, who knows how all it'll go. I think one thing you can say for sure, though, more and more learning will be in our own hands. We'll be increasingly responsible for managing our own learning. And learning how to learn has always been an important survival tool, but perhaps never more important than right now. Uh, I mean, it's common to think that learning is a matter of building up something in memory and then forgetting is losing some of what you built up. But it doesn't work that way, and in some respects, it's exactly the opposite. Retrieval is a learning event. So a fundamental aspect of, of human learning memory is that retrieving information from memory, as we all know, is a fallible event. Uh, uh, it's a kind of skill almost, like other skills, and it profits from practice. And retrieval events during the learning process that are more difficult or involved, owing to, to decreased access, some forgetting, constitute better practice for the later efforts to retrieve. So the more difficult involved an act of retrieval, the more that act of retrieval exercises the criterion processes you need at some later time. So, on. so those are some actual processes, but what I'm going to focus on mostly today is this broader framework that doesn't commit to the processes so much, just makes some basic distinctions. And the most fundamental one is this distinction between what Elizabeth and I called storage strength and retrieval strength. Now the background for this is that uh, Information and memory, an interesting thing, is no matter how well learned it was, how automatic it was at some point in our life, a combination lock number, some high school friend's name, whatever, as, as learned as it could possibly be and as automatic as it could be, with a long enough period of disuse, it becomes inaccessible. You can prove easily that it's there, relearning is, but it will become non-recallable. Now that the information remains in memory makes, we call this framework, the new theory of disuse because Thorndike, a uh, hundred years ago, enunciated the then dominant view that when things were not used, they decayed. Like footprints in the sand, that's what forgetting was like, and I think most lay people still have some kind of notion like that, and that was about as discredited a law as there is in psychology, and that's some competition actually, but um, <laughs> devastated by people working on the interference processes and so on. But what's kind of lost, I think, is Thorndike really said something very important at the same time, which was that use matters. As I, we use our memories, we also shape our memories. And the new theory of disuse basically just argues not that things decay, but we lose access to them. So this is the basic distinction in this framework that any memory representation of memory can be indexed in two different ways. One is storage strength. That index is sort of how interassociated or intertwined this procedure knowledge is with everything else it's related to. And then retrieval strength is the current ease of access. It's how primed or activated an item's representation is as a consequence of recency or what the current cues are. So those are two dimensions of a given memory representation. Now this distinction is hardly new with the Bjorks and as back in the 50s, Estes even said the two, two, two things that are, everybody had to assume, they couldn't agree about, we asked about learning theories, they couldn't agree about much of anything but they all needed to make some distinction like this, 
And Hall talked about momentary reaction potential and habit strength. Estes said habit strength and response strength. Even Skinner had to distinguish between reflex reserve and reflex strength. This corresponds to learning versus performance. That's a time-honored distinction in re research on learning. And the basic principle is what we can observe and measure one way or another at some time is performance. So for example, these things where you have learned something very, very well in your past. I mean, often hear people say something like, you don't forget how to type, you don't forget how to ride a bicycle. Uh, in this framework, Elizabeth and I have, oh yeah, you forget to ride a, how to ride a bicycle with, in one sense. Watch somebody's first minute on a bicycle if they haven't ridden for 30 years, say. But what happens is a storage strength thing is that relearning is so rapid that it looks like nothing was forgotten. So quickly, what's new is how they interact. And storage strength, we assume, grows purely, is never lost once it's accumulated. And it's a negatively accelerated function of current storage strength. The more you have, the less you can increase. And here, counterintuitively, and the higher the current retrieval strength is, the less the increase you can get in storage strength. This is where, in the framework, uh, forgetting becomes necessary to reach a new level of learning. If no forgetting in the retrieval uh, strength sense has happened, no additional storage strength will be accumulated. Something that's completely accessible is sort of unlearnable in the sense of getting to another level of learning beyond what you've already achieved. One thing we all want to do managing our own learning or advising students, anytime you can retrieve something rather than look it up, you have to do that. Otherwise, you're robbing yourself of a really powerful learning event. If something you want to remember later and you could produce it, you should definitely do that rather than look it up. And now, getting more concrete as far as kind of educational situations, we've already mentioned the spacing effect, that you space study sessions will enhance long-term recall. But if you don't measure learning at a delay, but measure it almost immediately after the second trial, we'll often find now a slight but pretty consistent advantage of mass practice. This corresponds to what in students' lives? Cramming, yeah. And it pays off immediately. It's just that it won't in the cumulative sense. <clears throat> and just to give you a feeling again how that falls out of this kind of framework, this is just a simulation of the, a new theory of disuse where what this shows is if I mass practice a bunch of trials, I will appear to be learning very rapidly compared to the case where I space those trials. But then if there's a long delay and I test at some criterion point, uh, that will cross over. I'll be substantially better. The way that comes out is here the top panel is retrieval strength. And you can see what happens is there's a lot of loss of retrieval strength between successive learning trials forgetting between trials. When I look at what's happening in the storage strength sense, I'm getting a higher level of storage strength in the space case, and that will govern the forgetting rate afterwards and produce the crossover when looked at long term. Now, because forgetting can enable learning, conditions instruction that appear to create difficulties, slowing the rate of apparent learning, can often optimize long-term retention and transfer. Whereas conditions that make performance improve very rapid often fail to support. And this puts us in a funny situation, whether it's our own learning or somebody else. If we are simply looking at our own current performance or our students' performance, very often this poor, the poor conditions of learning will produce much more apparent learning. In a lot of real-world situations, people in charge of training don't ever see what would be considered the criterion performance. At one point, I chaired a committee of the uh, National Research Council on techniques to enhance performance. We visited a lot of Army locations. 
the people in charge there don't actually get feedback or get to see what the performance level is back uh, in actual combat and a delay and so what they see is performance during training which can be highly misleading <clears throat> so examples varying the condition learning rather than keeping them constant and predictable is a desirable difficulty distributing we've already talked about spacing versus massing this is a, using tests rather than presentations at learning events. This could be this entire talk. I had to uh, not even go into this for time reasons. Um, but what um, the standard pattern is if I study something and then I might be repeatedly tested or get the chance to repeatedly restudy it, the restudying will look much better on the short term. But at a delay, the case where I studied and was repeatedly tested, even without feedback, will be better. <clears throat> and this is the one I do want to focus on a little bit more. I think its practical implications are, are very striking. Providing contextual interference during learning. Now, this contextual interference idea was advocated by researcher Bill Batty. Uh, nobody understood what he meant. Um, until a couple of his students did some experiments. The basic idea is, if I'm learning a number of different things, I will optimize long-term retention transfer if I arrange the instruction on those different things in whatever way will maximize the possible interference between them. All of our in instincts would be to minimize it. But during instruction, whatever the possible interference you should arrange the instruction and training to maximize it. And the best single example, there's more than one kind of way, but is this <clears throat> um, interleaving rather than blocking practice. So oh, I always have to mention this, there's a lot of desirable difficulties. The word desirable is important. There's lots of things we can do, managing our own learning or learning of other people that are undesirable now and forever after. They're desirable, and here we just can't take the time to go into each one of them, because the process of contending with them and overcoming those things engages the very processes that create long-term learning and retention. And they can easily become undesirable difficulties the learner's not equipped to respond to them. So for example, one of the major effects in research on memory is the generation effect, namely if via some cues and so on, you can get somebody to generate something and compare that with presenting it to them, memory will be much better long term where they generate it. But people have to, by virtue of their past knowledge and so on, be able to generate. If you're not equipped to generate, it's not productive. Okay, so interleaving rather than blocking practice. The benefits of interleaving were first shown in the domain of motor skills. I've saw, already mentioned an example of like tennis. One of the early studies involved learning the several different serves in badminton, a high lob, I guess, and a little one over the net and some forehand thing. And it showed the same number of trials if you practice those interleaved randomly, uh, appeared to be slowing down your performance but then when you tested people later, enhanced it, particularly if you took some transfer measure, like having people serve from the other side of the court. And so there were a lot of these things like that, and in, in research that Dominic Simon and I did, we wondered, are people fooled by their own performance? I mentioned instructors could be fooled by current performance. And we replicated this kind of experiment, asking people to predict how they would do on the final criterion test. And the people who were getting the blocked practice predicted they would do better than the people getting the interleaved, and the actual results are much the other way. So there's potential not just for instructors to be fooled by current performance, but also for us ourselves to take our performance. So there's other indices of this, learning formulas, uh, children's penmanship. And then more recently, we have found that this also applies to learning categories and concepts. And I'll just show you one quick experiment of that. Uh, this one's interesting by Rohr and Taylor. They had the participants um, learning 
the formulas for volumes of things like a wedge, a wedge, a spheroid, a half cone, and so on. And they would do a lot of problems with different dimensions learning these formulas. Those could be blocked by the type of solid, the problems. That would be the way it would typically be done at the, in the end of a chapter in a physics or math book. Or they could have mixed them all up together. And educationally, this is really significant because by the end of practice, it looked like, sure, you would want to do it blocked. But this test a week later, a three to one advantage where you had interleave training. Now what's really, uh, you wonder how far can we extend these things? Well, there was just a report in the New York Times on uh, Doug Rohr and his colleagues are now uh, in, uh, what, what town's the University of South Florida in anyway? It's not too far from Tampa, but in that area, uh, collaborating with some public schools, they're breaking down algebra instruction to either do it the traditional blocked way or do an interleave things. And the initial results show a substantial advantage on the criterion what amounts to the final exam. So there's always an issue whether these extend, but this, this has a great potential for doing really novel things in educational environments. But now think about induction for a while. This is really important, underlies almost every field of initial instruction in, in science, engineering, whatever, the, the basic classification and so on. And for example, training in medical school could involve learning to recognize a certain disorder from these lung x-rays that may all indicate look different, but all point to some uh, malignancy maybe. We could learn, as in the experiment I show you, we could learn a given painter's styles from examples of that artist's painting. This kind of learning is very important. It's, it's, it's how kids early in their life come to organize their world and so on. And so, for example, if I tell you this is a Gen 2 penguin, that's a Gen 2, that's a Gen 2, that's a Gen 2, where's the Gen 2? I see some people, if I'm reading it right up here. Now notice, you didn't see that particular picture. But you extracted something, even as fast as that went by, that lets you uh, maybe, maybe you encoded that little patch, something like that as a commonality. And so we set out to actually show that this is one situation where massing's better Blocking is better than spacing. So the idea is <clears throat> that if I show it to you that way, you can notice these commonalities. Whereas I showed you a Gen 2 and then a Lachesis, a Reinhardt back to a Gen 2, that would be interleaving would make it difficult to think back and encode the commonalities. And we were triggered, uh, the Dean of Educational Psychologists, uh, Ernst Rothkopf once said, not in print, but I remembered it ever since he said it, spacing's a friend of recall, but the enemy of induction. If you need to see commonalities, things need to be next to each other. So to kind of wrap up, what do uh, college students already know and not know about how to study? Well, we surveyed 472 intra-psych students at UCLA. <clears throat> Some of these results are published. We, Nate Cornell and myself, and just made up some easy questions like, what do, how do you decide what to study next? Notice the dominant answer, just about six. Whatever is due soonest, most overdue. Whatever I haven't studied for the longest time, that would be what? Spacing. Uh, interesting had nothing to do with it. Uh, what do I feel during? And then only 11% I plan my study schedule ahead of time and I study whatever I schedule. They're actually liars, those people. <laughs> if you quiz yourself, why did you do so? So potentially you could say I learned more that way, but uh, only 18%. This actually is valid to figure out how well I've learned the information I'm studying. Tests have that big virtue compared to restudying. 
They will identify your state of knowledge much more than will restudying. I find quizzing more. I usually not quiz myself. Do you usually return to the course material or review it after the course has ended? That would be really a good thing to do in terms of long-term memory. 86% no. <clears throat> when you study, you typically reread a text article more than once. Uh, only 19% said they reread. 60% said they go back and read their highlighting or underlining. And then finally, would you say you study the way because a teacher or teachers taught you to study that way? So notice only 80% said no. And for the 20%, we don't know what they were taught, whether it was good or bad. But basically, I think there's an underlying implicit assumption that somehow people learn on their own how to learn. They don't need. We worry about whether they have math proficiency, English, something other. We don't worry about whether they're equipped to take on four or five, six more years of managing this thing we call a, a college education, for example. Does it matter? Well, one study following up our work asked the same questions, but a few others, and then correlated it with GPA and the high higher grade people were more likely to plan the schedule, more likely to be less likely to be influenced by impending deadlines, less likely to engage in late night studying. That surprised me. I thought that was good. But um, more likely to endorse self-testing, rereading notes, making outlines, and so on. Now, perhaps we shouldn't be, in another sense, critical or say, why don't students know more? This is a diagram from something, an uh, annual review of psychology review we just completed recently. And in order to become really metacognitively sophisticated as a learner, there's a lot involved. What this is meant to capture is there's an acquisition phase, then there's maintaining a retention phase, then there's retrieval at the time you need the information. And at each point, there's monitoring and control activities. You monitor whether you feel like you've achieved a certain level. You decide whether to terminate study. You pick the type of practicing. Uh, at the time of test, you kind of, there, all of these things that are boxes here have been domains of active research. And really to become maximally sophisticated as a learner involves a lot. But at a minimum, you can say that the average student is tending to both misassess and mismanage uh, the level of learning, the type of activities. Now also, the concluding comment is just that societal attitudes, assumptions, and so on also can play a role that impede effective learning. So we might misunderstand the meaning and role of errors, think they're to be avoided, whereas optimal instruction may often in fact, induce errors. Over attributing the differences in performance to innate. It's I didn't do well because it's not my thing. I'm looking for my thing, my family, my ethnic group, whatever, our thing. We're good at that, we're not. People labeling themselves and not ever really exploring their potential to learn. And one is just assuming that efficient learning is easy learning, that somehow if people will just do things the way that meshes with my learning style. Here's where I'll lose rapport with some of you if you're learning styles fans, so you could shut your eyes or something now. But uh, this incredibly popular approach to learning styles just kind of has behind it this meshing hypothesis, which is that if it will just be presented a way that will mesh with my style, learning will just kind of happen. I sometimes tell students, I can tell you activities that will save you a lot of time, that will increase your grade point average, but they're not easy activities. And the other thing is, we're right now in a phase uh, where these laboratory studies are being tested in the classroom. Uh, the whole literature on the benefits of test effects, they've been across the last five years or so, do they transfer into actual classrooms? The Rodiger group, other people around the country looked at that. And yes, we see that. How about something like spacing? People have looked at it. A uh, nice recent study has to do with surgical training, microsurgeries, where 
same training sessions, either spaced or masked, and then various types of long-term benefits. And, and so far, really, these things are holding up. They're, they're transferring. There's even a few cases where, you know, when we use simple materials and try to gain extreme control over things, it's even possible that that can reduce the size of certain effects. It becomes, you know, we don't, we don't engage the full dynamics as much as if it was a real thing. So uh, it's legitimate, absolutely, to raise issues about does this all kind of apply to uh, higher level learning. But that's an ongoing project where so far it's very encouraging. And I actually picked, when I picked those, those particular desirable difficulties, I picked ones where, if necessary, I could show uh, a range of the kind of places where, where it does happen. I sort of say, uh, you know, if we take this all seriously, what are the implications for design of instruction? So, I mean, uh, these course syllabi we're all so proud of as the teachers when we work hard to make, quote, well organized, generally have this property that we block it by topics. And we think that's the way to do it. This research says, well, if, we and we test on a topic and then drop it, or maybe not. But in any case, this suggests that if, if you as a teacher face up to what is it I want people to take away from this course, maybe it's only a half a dozen fundamental principles or something that, that they could remember indefinitely. Those things have to come up be revisited multiple times, hopefully in the context of something else they're related to. And, and the course will look very, very different. In fact, sometimes when I talk to teachers, they have all sorts of good ideas like, oh, does that, oh, I could do this, I'm, you know, really creative ideas. And then the next thing they say is something like, well, wait a minute, like, the students rate my teaching. I mean, if, if it's made to seem more difficult, um, you know, it's, I've sometimes said that for all these years and uh, having won UCLA's teaching award and so on, that if somebody gave me a new course and said, do everything you know how to do to make students' long-term memory of key concepts the best, I think I could give that a big try, or if they said, no, everything you know how to do to get the highest possible course ratings, uh, know something about that too, but what's awful is they're not, would not be the same course. They'd be quite different course. Now, to be fair to students, I think some, um, for example, the benefits of frequent low stakes quizzing that's embedded throughout the course, low stakes seems to be a key, Students will groan if you tell them that you know, maybe each lecture is going to start or end or something with a few questions and this and that. But uh, Elizabeth's experiment with this and, and other colleagues, by the end of the course, that is regarded positively as much as people groan initially, gradually feel like this is helping me monitor. You know, no one of these is crucial at all. It's helping me monitor what I need to know, and you get comfortable with it. And um, so it's possible uh, in, in teaching the cognitive psychology course, where in fact I did try to introduce lots of things that would seem strange, I was in a position there to run a few, few quick demonstrations that what they predicted would be best is not was worse and so on. And you know, so then they can think, well, maybe this guy knows something. And maybe I, you know, but when I've talked to more teachers more broadly, you know, a history teacher says, well, I can't take a week out to talk about cognitive psychology or whatever. So uh, it is a challenge because I think if you take uh, variation, interleaving, spacing, test effects, and some others, I didn't take them all seriously, uh, the course will be very different from what it's like. Now, some kind of things, certain kind of laboratory courses and other things like that, they incorporate a lot of this already. And maybe the so-called flipped classroom would end up doing more of this and 
but this is what you guys are all going to figure out in the HILT program. Yeah.